Well, I'm going to get going because we have a short amount of time together today, um, and I could talk to you about beekeeping for three days straight. So let me get moving here. Um, like Chad said, my name is Andrea Walker Bravo. I'm a faculty member for USU Extension in Salt Lake County. I've been keeping bees for, gosh, I think it's been six or seven years now, and I've been running uh, beginning beekeeping and advanced beekeeping classes throughout that time. Uh, this I tossed in a picture of my daughter. This is like six years ago when we first started, and she is now uh, a 13-year-old successful business owner. She makes products out of uh, honey and wax and, and beehive, so it's really fun and awesome hobby to get into, um, and I'm excited to share more with you. I did want to start off just to help me as I'm speaking to you kind of frame things. So in the chat, not in the Q&A, but in the chat, if you guys could quickly drop in a comment, uh, what's your experience with beekeeping and what are you hoping to learn? So I'd love to see that um, real quick, just so I know who you are and who's here. Okay, perfect. Thanks, you guys. You can, I'll keep looking at those as we go through, uh, but it sounds like there's some experience here, but most people are fairly new or want to know how to get started. Oops, sorry, I'm moving along here. And actually that's perfect because 20 to 30 minutes doesn't give us time to get super deep into it. So I'll give a high level overview and then provide some more resources. Um, so this is just a list of common concerns that people often have when they think about keeping bees or starting to keep bees. Is it safe to have around my family? Do I need a big yard? Swarms are always a concern. What will my neighbors think? Pests, wasps, hornets, um, allergic reactions, will I get stung? How much honey can I get? And what will things cost? So we'll touch on a lot of these, but a, a few points to look at right now. Is it safe to have bees around my family? I think overwhelmingly the answer is yes. If, of course, you know what your allergic reaction is. So looking at two of those points, you will likely get stung as a beekeeper. Um, it, I don't get stung a ton, but I have been stung and I, I expect to get stung. So you do want to make sure that you know how you react. Uh, some people, the more they get stung by bees, the less the reaction is. Other people, the more they get stung, the worse it gets. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, I don't have any issues with it around my family or my livestock. You know, my bees are in an area that's, area that's pretty accessible by everyone and we haven't had any, any issues with it. Um, I like to think about my neighbors as I do with my chickens. Um, you know, my neighbors are happy that I have bees because I give them honey every once in a while, just like I give my neighbors eggs every once in a while. So they're usually not too worried about it. Uh, how much honey can I have produced? Uh, that's an answer that we always say it depends and we'll go over that and I'll share some of the thoughts on what it will cost to get started. So a few things again overview that I want to share sources of information. There's a lot of really good information out there as far as beekeeping goes. Um, there are a lot of books that you can find on beekeeping. Uh, there's be by beekeeping biology, stories guide to beekeeping, some great resources out there. There's also a lot of information on the internet. Um, I would caution you as you look to information on the internet, uh, one reason is that everybody has an opinion. There's a saying in beekeeping that if you ask a question, to five beekeepers, you will likely get six answers. And um, that's because one of them at least will change their answer or has multiple opinions on the subject. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it really depends on your situation and um, kind of what I call your beekeeping philosophy, why you're keeping bees, what that looks for, like for you. Um, you also need to understand the information you see online may be regional, right? If you're watching a YouTube video and there's this amazing beekeeper from Florida, the practices that are happening in Florida and the things that they're doing as far as their beekeeping may be very different than here in Utah, right? Because of climate, because of season, um, you know, all of those different things, different pets may be found in different places. So you need to kind of take everything with a grain of salt and make sure that it matches up to your needs and your location. There's some great beekeeping classes that are around. We offer a class at Wheeler Farm. I'll share more information on that. And there are a lot of really great associations and beekeeping groups. So I've listed a few of the local beekeeping associations. Uh, Wasatch Beekeeper Association, which is, main, is Salt Lake County. They have a mentorship program that's really great. 
So you join the beekeeper association and they'll match you up with a mentor who can help you work through keeping bees. So those are also great sources of information for you. So I mentioned your beekeeping philosophy, and this is something that I really feel strongly about that as you um, start keeping bees, you need to figure out why you're doing this and, and what your goal is, excuse me, because that will shape your practices for keeping bees. So are you mainly interested in pollination or honey or just bee biology? Are you managing your hives for pollen? Some people use it for bee stings. Uh, some people want it to actually be a moneymaker and some people want it just because it's a fun and challenging hobby. Um, for my bees at my home, um, like I mentioned earlier, my daughter uses uh, the wax and other products from the hive itself, not just the honey. So the practices, um, the best practices that I use on my hives may be different from other people because I take the wax and other people might leave the wax within their hives. So you need to think about why you're keeping bees. I've got a few slides here just with an overview, and you probably know a lot of this. I'm sure many of you have heard that you know, one out of every three bites of food that we take relies on bees for pollination. Now, this just isn't honeybees. There's native bees and other bees as well that are providing pollination services, but our honeybees do quite a bit. Uh, pollination is valued at $15 billion a year industry. These stats are a little bit old, but there's over 2 million bee colonies are rented each year for pollination services, and the rent can be as high as $250 per colony. So until the 1980s, most of our hives were managed for honey production, and now that has flipped. The majority of our hives are actually managed for pollination. Uh, this is something that I didn't see until I started keeping bees, but if you pay attention, um, in the next couple of months, you'll likely see big semi-trucks loaded with bees headed out to California to the almond orchards for pollination services. So the bees will be shipped off to California, they'll do their pollination work, and then they'll come back here at other locations to finish out the season um, and to produce honey. So again, that's kind of a different, if you're thinking about your beekeeping philosophy, the beekeepers that have a lot of hives and they're shipping them off to California for pollination services are typically our commercial beekeepers. And they are going to manage hives very differently than we do if we have one or two hives in our backyard. So that's definitely something to consider when you're looking at information. We are the beehive state. Um, there are many beekeepers in Utah and it's definitely becoming an increasing uh, hobby. Uh, there's been an increase of 800% from 2017 to 2012. I don't have the current stats on that. I need to check with, with UDAF, but it's definitely growing and growing. Um, most hobbyists have less than 10 colonies in their backyard. I bet that there's bees around you and someone probably has an apiary close and you may not know it. Most are very discreet. Uh, we do have some commercial beekeepers in Utah and there's about 30,000 colonies here. There are government rules that uh, you do need to abide by as you're looking at getting bees. The Utah Department of Ag and Food requires that you have a beekeeping license and you register your bees. Now, a lot of people might say, well, I don't want, you know, the Utah state, uh, state government being the bee police and coming in and telling me what to do with my hive, but there actually really is a lot of benefit to this. Um, the Utah Department of Ag and Food Apiary Program is there to help us ensure that our apiaries stay healthy. Uh, they do inspections and will come out to your APR and help you think through the health and do mic checks and other things. So it's really important um, uh, when you have a license and have your hives registered, they can also help identify you of potential issues or threats to your hive in the area. So it's an important thing to uh, follow these licensing rules. There's also some other really good Utah law that you um, would want to consider. Uh, you need to identify your apiaries. You can't just have beehives out in the field that don't have any registration um, on there. Hives are required to have movable frames, and I'll show you why in just a minute. Um, this is so that we can inspect and ensure the health. Um, if you know your hive is infected or exposed to disease, you can't sell, give away, or move the bees without the consent of the bee inspector or the Department of Ag and Food. Um, hives found to have American foul brood are required to be destroyed. This is the one that always scares people and why they don't want um, 
the Department of Ag and Food necessarily messing with their hives or involved in their apiaries. But this isn't always necessarily true. Um, American fowl brood is a, is a, a nasty disease that, that beehives can um, contract and it, it is really bad and it can have potential to spread and cause a lot of issues for our overall bee health. And so the Department of Ag and Food is really monitors that closely, but they don't just come in and, and destroy and burn all of your hives. They come in and they help you manage it. They ensure that it truly is American Salbert and not something different. Um, and, and they'll really help you mitigate for that. Uh, we're not allowed to have aggressive hives and to sell your honey, you have to have proper registration and labeling. A little bit of interesting honeybee history. Um, honey hunting has been going on for a long time. Uh, 6,000 BC was when honey hunting in Africa was really first noticed. Um, it was the first source of refined sugar and definitely a highly prized resource. So this isn't something new. I wanted to show you a picture of what a natural beehive might look like. Uh, now, obviously, this isn't a, a natural hive. This is the bottom of a barbecue. Um, but it looks like the cover was on and some bees decided to move in there and they created these large wax honeycomb fans under, on the underside of, of the wing of this barbecue. And these are really beautiful. This is what it might look like in a hollow tree or on a cliff ledge if you were looking at a wild hive. Um, you know, whether it, we don't have many wild hives here, but this could also be what you might see if this got into someone's attic. Um, or, you know, bee populations that get into the soffit between walls, it would look like this natural honeycomb fan. And this is beautiful, but I'll show you why this can be a challenge and, and why we can't manage hives like this in just a minute. I also have a picture of a skep, uh, so straw, straw skep, this is our, our state symbol, right? The, the honeycomb, or sorry, the, the beehive. The, the beehive state symbol, the straw skeps are what we really use to first actually keep bees. So rather than going out and finding a wild bee colony and taking the honey, this um, building these skeps, we were actually able to contain the bees and take them with us. So the bees would build all of those honeycomb frames like I just showed you inside of these straw baskets. And then the beekeeper would have to destroy the baskets to harvest the honey, and then they would have to start over with their bee colony. So skeps have been used for about 2000 years, uh, but they are not the practice that we use anymore. If you remember back to Utah law, we do have to have movable hive, movable frames. So the modern equipment that we use now, uh, typically most people run what's called a Lang trough hive. So it's an eight or 10 frame hive. The frames are the wooden pieces that you can see in the picture. And each of these frames goes into a box. And what Lorenzo Langstroth, who developed these hives, recognized is that if you put these frames in the box and you left three eighths of an inch of space in between each of these frames, the bees would build the honey, the, the wax comb and put the honey in so that it could stay nice and um, nice and tight and clean and the bills, the, the, sorry, sorry, I was just looking in the chat, got a little um, distracted there. Katie, I'll address that, or Kate Wheeler, who just talked about Utah Senate Bill 59. I can talk about that in a minute. Uh, the beehive, the bee space is three-eighths of an inch. And basically what that means is that with that small amount of space, the bees will kind of keep their comb and their honey in these nice tidy rows and you can lift out each of those frames so that you can inspect them. You can look at the honey, you can look at the resources in the hive, you can look at the brood and um, the eggs and everything in there and look for disease and parasites and other issues that you might have. Okay, so this is just uh, some more pictures showing the different um, pieces of the hive. You can buy them already assembled or you can create them yourself. So here's a picture of why that bee space is advantageous and also critical for the beekeeper. So this is a Langstroth hive. Um, and what happened here is the picture on the left, the beekeeper had a box with the frames in the box. And then for whatever reason, they put another box on top, but they did not put any frames into this hive. 
And so the bees decided they were going to continue building and they built out all of this beautiful honeycomb and honey without the frames in it. And while this is great and it looks beautiful, as far as beekeeping goes and inspecting this and managing for the health of this colony, this is very, very challenging. Uh, we can't get in there and look to see what the brood looks like, uh, what the eggs and the larva look like in here. We can't uh, easily sample for varroa mites and pests and disease. So this makes it really hard on the beekeepers and the in inspectors. And also if we wanted to harvest any of this, uh, you know, this would just be harvesting big chunks of honeycomb. So that is why you know, really having the movable frames is advantageous for the beekeeper. Okay, let's jump into tools real quick and all of the things that you might need. So with beekeeping, you do need some different tools. You need your hive body, which is what I showed you a minute ago with the Langstroth hive, but you also need beekeeping tools. You need a smoker, which I'll show you a picture of in just a minute, and a hive tool, which is like a mini crowbar that you can use to pry things apart. Um, you typically will want a hat and a veil or some sort of protective bee suit. I recommend to all beginning beekeepers that they just get everything, that they get a hat, they get a, a jacket, they have gloves, they have pants, just so that they are comfortable beekeeping. Um, as you progress in your beekeeping journey, you may feel like, gosh, I don't need gloves or I don't need the beekeeping pants or the jacket. Maybe I just want a hat or a veil. Uh, but you never know. And I, I feel pretty strongly that the more relaxed that you are around the bees, um, you know, the better the experience will be for everybody. There are also things that you might need when you're ready to harvest honey. Um, so there's different extractors and extractors can range from $150 to $1,500, depending on the type you get. There's hand crank extractors. Um, there's one big motorized centrifuge extractors. Um, you can also just scrape your honey out. So there's a lot of variation. Um, and I would say that it really depends on how into it you want to get. You can easily go very basic, um, you know, and you'll spend money on, on your hive and your bees. But as far as the tools and equipment, you know, you don't have to necessarily get super fancy. One of the other advantages of the bee associations is that many of them have equipment that you can borrow or rent as well if you're looking for a large extractor or, or other equipment that you'd like to use. Here's a little bit more information on the smoker. Um, so this can sometimes be a, a controversial piece. Uh, some people do not love using smoke. Um, but according to you know, research out of Montana State, University of Montana, that you know, the smoker really is kind of your best tool. Um, the smoke, what it does is it masks the pheromones from the bees and it disrupts their communication. So as you're opening the hive, they may be getting ready to send out an alarm signal through pheromones saying, gosh, we've got a problem here. There's an alert. There's an intruder. We all need to be on the defensive. The smoke masks that and it calms the bees down. It also encourages them to move off of the top of the hive and dive down into the frames. Um, they will go and gorge themselves with honey to get ready to leave, just in case the, it truly is a fire and they need to abandon the hive. So it's a great tool for, uh, for our beekeepers. We like to use it, but not necessarily overuse it by, by smoking the bees too much. But it's a good tool to have. So then you need to think about getting bees. Uh, so there's a few ways that you can get bees. Um, if you are planning to keep bees this season, so if you would like to get bees for this year, 2023, you should be ordering bees now. Um, I would suggest finding one of the local bee, um, bee equipment and package suppliers and getting on their list. It can be about 140, probably to $160 for three and a half pounds of bees um, and a bread queen. So, so get on that list right now. Um, you can also get free bees. I don't usually suggest this for beginning beekeepers, but when bees swarm, and this will ha start happening in usually April, May season, you'll start having swarms of bees. So when a colony is successfully overwintered, so it, it 
went inside into the hive for the fall, it stays in the hive during the cold winter months. As the population grows in the spring, too many bees will be in that hive. So half of the population will leave, and that's what a swarm is. Half of the population will leave to go find a new home, and the other half of the bees that are left within the hive will raise a new queen. So the queen leaves with the first population looking for a new home, and that's when you get swarms. So for seasoned beekeepers, they're really excited about swarms because it's like $150 flying around in the air that you can capture and bring back to your own hive. The other thing that you can do is if you know of local beekeepers, if you have a friend that has bees, um, the best practice so that we can prevent swarms from happening is that we split those colonies before they get too big and decide to do it on their own. So a split from someone else's hive or your own, if you already have bees, is, the, is really one of the better ways to uh, start a colony or, or grow your apiary. The reason being is that, you know, if my neighbor has bees and I know that they made it over the winter, they started in 2022 and they lasted through the winter and they're doing really, really well now, it's kind of like a proven set of bees, right? I get these ones, I know they've made it, I know that they seem to do well in my area and they'll just be better adapted moving forward. Okay, I got to crank through some of these real quick. Um, a starter kit can save you money. So a lot of the, the bee the bee providers um, will sell you not only the hive woodwork and the frames, but they'll also give you the smoker and the gloves and the bee suits as well as the bees. And that could maybe cost you between $400 and $500. Um, you'll want to think about hive location, uh, typically out of public sight, just so people don't mess with them, away from people and pets to the extent that you feel like you need it to be. Like I mentioned, mine are fairly close to me and it, it hasn't been a problem, but it's, it's something that you would want to consider. Uh, if it's super windy, you might want to consider having a wind break. Um, think about sun and shade in your yard. Uh, most You want your beehives to be in the sun and facing east or south, southeast, preferably. You also want to think about a water source for your bees. This is something that's also in Utah, Utah law is that we have to provide a water source for our bees on our property. Uh, this is where bees become a nuisance. So swarms is one thing, and when they're looking for water is another. This is when your neighbors will call and complain and say, hey, your bees are in my dog's water dish, or my kids were out at the pool and there's bees all over. You have to make sure that you provide some sort of water source on your property. This is just another slide, and I think we get to share all of these slides with all of you, but important topic for beekeepers. And this is, we do a Thriving Hives class, and we've got information on our website that has information on all of these different topics. But I'm going to skip through a couple of these and go right to finish this off with honeybee pests and disease. So the biggest thing I would like to impress upon you is if you decide to be beekeepers, or if you are currently beekeepers, um, you are also mite keepers. So the number one reason why beehives and apiaries fail here in Utah and mostly everywhere in the United States are the varroa mite. So varroa mites are parasites that feed on the cat brood and adult bees and they weaken them um, and they're kind of vectors for other diseases to come in. And so if you are, again, if you are a beekeeper or you're planning to become a beekeeper, just know that you will also be a varroa mite manager. Um, I think this is something that often is intimidating to people because there's different, uh, you know, different pesticides that you can use. You can use chemical treatments, you can use organic treatments, uh, but it is something that we have to be monitoring for and treating for in our hives if we want to have successful bee colonies. So I'm gonna leave it there because I know that it is 258 and I want to make sure that we stay on time. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions that came up. Well, great, great job. Um, very interesting to me. I already asked my wife if we could have bees and she politely told me no way. So, <laughs> um, but I did want to throw some of these questions at you. You got quite a few questions to go through. Some of these we can combine. And I think a really easy one off the get-go is can you re 
just restate for us the cost for registering your hive. Is that based on monthly, annually, or is it a one-time fee? It's an annual registration, um, and it depends on how many hives you have. Um, I'd have to go back in my slides to double check, but I think it, it I think I pay ten dollars a year um, if you have less than twenty five hives. So okay. it's not a huge cost. And one of the things I didn't say is one of the benefits to that is if your bees die or something happens to your bees, you can send a sample of your bees into the Department of Ag and Food, and they will test those bees and send you a report on you know what they could find and what they think may have happened to your bees. And they'll do that for free if you're a registered beekeeper. If not, I believe it's $40 a sample. So it's well worth your money to pay the $10 registration fee for the services that they provide. Yeah, I did like the little bit of consulting that you said that will happen when they do that. Mm -hmm. um, combining a couple other questions real quick, um, as far as the type of hives, someone asked with your experience of the top bar, Hive, is that the same thing, essentially, just a different name for the type of hive you described? Yep. So a top bar hive is a, a horizontal hive. And rather than having full square frames, it just has bars that sit along the top. It almost looks like a xylophone across the top. And the bees um, build their honeycomb fans down from those hives. So it's usually kind of more like a V-shaped box that expands out. I have run a top bar hive. Um, it, it worked as well. It's just a little bit different management um, just based on kind of the shape of things and um, where you don't have plastic frames in your hives. If it's hot, you know, you're working with a lot of kind of soft wax that can easily fall apart. Um, but they're great. I mean, it definitely works. There's a lot of different types of hives. I saw someone else ask the opinion on flow hives versus a traditional hive. A, a flow hive, if you're familiar with that, um, they, beekeepers have issues with it a little bit because it, it's promoted as like honey on tap because they have these special frames in them that you go out and you turn a key and it offsets the wax and the honey drains out. Um, and so those, they definitely work. Um, what, what traditional beekeepers are worried about is that people will just toss those out in a field and say, great, I've got honey and won't actually manage their bees. So you still have wow. to manage your hives in the same way for pests and disease and other things. It's just a different type of frame that you're putting in. 